good over online. Thanks again for joining us for another Lunch and Learn um, regarding the release of the Diabetes Canada Clinical <laughs> Practice Guide. I uh, will just um, start off with a reminder for those that have viewed the morning today to so please do mute your lines. I know we're getting some feedback from a couple areas. So could you please double check that your lines are muted so you can mute your line um, with the microphone button or star six. Uh, to mute your line. We will open up for questions and discussion as um, as we work through the presentation, and I'll give you information as to how to unmute at that time. But uh, welcome. Thank you for joining us today. Today's topic that Dr. Richard Phillips is going to be presenting on is diabetes and pregnancy uh, and providing some highlight on the updated guidelines um, on that topic. Dr. Phillips, for those of you that haven't joined us at a previous Lunch and Learn, is uh, an adult endocrinologist that joined us in the Interior Health Region just about a year ago, works out of Kelowna, uh, practice out of Kelowna, and also is our regional medical lead for diabetes. So very happy to have him giving up his lunch hours over these upcoming weeks and the past few that we've had around um, information around these clinical practice guidelines. So we'll pass it over to Dr. Phillips to get started with the presentation. Right, thanks, Angela. So I've got the bouncing ball here. Um, welcome, everybody. Um, I uh, hope everybody has uh, has read the chapter 36 on uh, diabetes and pregnancy. It's actually a, a monster chapter. It's the biggest one um, out of our guidelines, um, and it'll take you a couple of days to get through it. Um, and uh, in keeping with the length of the chapter, the number of slides that Diabetes Canada has provided for uh, this section is uh, monstrous as well. There were like 93 slides for the particular chapter that's uh, available online. Um, so I'm not going to go through 93 slides, obviously, but I'll uh, I'll go through each of the recommendations we have, and we'll spend more time on some than others. Uh, and uh, there's a, a few things that I think are a little bit uh, contentious, and uh, I'll uh, bring those up when they come up. And uh, some things are a bit new. Um, much of not much different from the 2013 guidelines. So, without further ado, um, indeed, longer, I agree, for recommendations. So, uh, <clears throat> recommendation one is stressing the importance of preconception care for. Uh, with pre-existing diabetes, both type 1 and type 2, uh, outcomes are improved um, when uh, pregnancies are planned uh, and if uh, patients are followed and they're optimized in an interdisciplinary uh, setting uh, prior to pregnancy. Um, clearly, it's important for um, people to be on reliable birth control until they need to pursue pregnancy. Uh, and it's important for us to remind them that they'll need to be on uh, vitamins and folic acid uh, at off um, teratogenic drugs prior to pregnancies. Um, so, reproductive age women, we we need to uh, you know discuss this uh, intermittently uh, with them to make sure that they're uh, prepared prior to pregnancy. So, this is, uh, uh, the, the the first half of the presentation is dealing with women with type one and or type 2 diabetes, um, and then GDM is, is later on. So recommendation two, uh, clearly those women with polycystic ovarian syndrome setting of uh, type 2 diabetes, if they have to go on uh, insulin sensitizing drugs such as metformin, uh, that may improve their ovulatory status, and so we need to be um, um these women that they're more likely to get pregnant if they're starting on metformin. Um, or if they're on a program of significant weight loss, uh, that will improve their fertility. So to be prepared about that. Um, so type one, type two uh, preconception counseling. Ideally, recognizing that in type one diabetes, um, this occurs perhaps 50% of the time in many jurisdictions. In type two diabetes, um, it's much less than that. So preconception counseling tends not to occur as often in, in women with type 2 diabetes. So if, uh, we'll have to try to do a better job with that, seeing as the numbers of uh, reproductive age women with type 2 diabetes is increasing to um, increasing weight 
and uh, people putting off pregnancies to later ages. Um, okay. So the uh, is to uh, uh, reduce complications, including um, uh, congenital malformations related to hyperglycemia by getting the A1C down effectively preconception. Uh, so um, although say ideally preconception A1C less than 7%, uh, if possible, we should be striving for uh, an A1C of less than or equal to 6.5% preconception if it's done safely with the idea that by the third trimester, ideally to reduce macrosomia events, A1C is less than 6.1% or 6% or less by the third trimester. Difficult to achieve, but that is um, currently the goal uh, to reduce complications, including general malformations. Uh, uh, this, it, this is a change, uh, is my, my understanding, with regards to the folic acid uh, supplementation. So, prenatal vitamins and folic acid for three months preconception. And the, uh, I used to recommend, you know, four or five milligrams of folic acid for women with diabetes. Uh, now they're saying that uh, um, the evidence is only there for the one milligram dose of folic acid um, as opposed to higher doses. So, uh, they adjusted their recommendations. In that regard, and of course we should be uh, getting rid of uh, teratogenic medications preconception, um, including statins, ACE inhibitors, and ARBs. Um, the later on ACE inhibitors and ARBs with regards to pregnancy uh, a little bit mixed. Um, they're suggesting that certainly by the second and third trimester. Uh, that uh, the inhibitors and the ARBs are absolutely contraindicated. Uh, if a woman gets pregnant while on an ACE inhibitor or an ARB, that doesn't seem to be a problem, but that just it simply means they need to, to switch to something else in the first trimester if they happen to be on an ACE inhibitor or an ARB, uh, specifically uh, labetol or alpha-methyldopa or, or a channel blocker. Um, moving right along, uh, <clears throat> I thought this was uh, interesting. Let's read it um, word for word. So, conception care. Women on metformin and or glyburide may continue on, on these agents if glycemic control is adequate until pregnancy is achieved. Uh, women on other antihyperglycemic agents, DPP-4 inhibitors, SGLT2 inhibitors, GLP-1 receptor agonists, need to switch to insulin prior to conception. Um, I guess my only comment there would be that then with type diabetes uh, that are not meeting glycemic targets on metformin and or glyburide. And for those people, uh, they could be switched to uh, insulin preconception if they're not meeting glycemic targets. I used to see, uh, not uncommonly, people on metformin preconception, they'd have good A1Cs, uh, you know, good good blood sugars. They would um, uh, confirm a pregnancy, and then they would get referred to the diabetes clinic, and it may take you know, two to four weeks to get into the clinic, in which time the, the physician has asked the patient to stop the metformin. They have, uh, you know, two to four weeks without any medication, and the blood sugars go up, and that's clearly not the right thing to do. So uh, until they are switched to um, to insulin, then the metformin and glyburide can uh, continue. <clears throat> uh, ideally, um, the microvascular complications would be uh, okay. assessed for preconception. Sorry, just we have someone that's uh, got their phone off mute. If you could please all check your lines, ensure you're on mute with star six. Thank you. Uh, I'll open it up for questions in a, in a minute. Um, so uh, as far as the microvascular screening, uh, ideally women with type 1 and type 2 diabetes would have uh, an eye exam preconception. Um, and ideally, again, in the first trimester, uh, PRN thereafter during pregnancy and, and with the year of delivery uh, simply because um, diabetes may accelerate development and or progression of uh, diabetic retinopathy. Um, so that hasn't changed. It's not to accomplish, but uh, that's the recommendation. As far as uh, other microvascular complications, looking for albuminuria, evidence for chronic kidney disease, 
preconception. Uh, clearly, if patients have albuminuria or reduced GFR, that significantly increases the risk for uh, preeclampsia and preterm delivery in that setting. Seeing you there. Um, the uh, interdisciplinary care when um, is is an ideal situation. Um, diabetes uh, physician with uh, educator, patient, obstetrician, etc. Um, the uh, with type 2 diabetes, um, most of them are going to require a switch to insulin. You'll have the, the case of metformin doing the, uh, the job throughout pregnancy and, and still meeting glycemic targets. The majority of people will require insulin. Um, Non-insulin antihyperglycemic agents are not approved uh, for use in pregnancy. So, of course, uh, both type 1s and type 2s, the ideal regimen is either uh, basal bolus insulin with an regimen or insulin pump therapy. Uh, the targets are strict, uh, and they remain unchanged at fasting and preprandial uh, five, uh, less than 5.3 pre-meal, even one hour postprandial sugars, less than 7.8 one hour, less than 6.72 two hour, that's unchanged. A1C less than 6.5% at conception if possible and less than 6% by the third trimester. Um, if glycemia is limiting, then you'll have to relax those those uh, um, targets. The the reason for the strict targets is even if people have A1Cs of in type in the type one population, A1Cs between six and a half and seven percent by the uh bimester, the rate of macrosomia is still incredibly high, uh fifty percent plus. Um so the only way that we can really make a dent in reducing macrosomia rates and the attendant complications is actually to get the A one C uh down into the non diabetic range. Very difficult to do. Some uh, patients are able to do it uh, these days um, with um, CM particularly uh, and either MDI or, or pump therapy. So, um, especially if they've only had their diabetes for a few years. Um, so it is theoretically possible. It just takes a lot of work. Um, and for, for certainly for type. Uh, ones and most type twos will be doing the sugars pre meal and bedtime as well as uh one or two hour post prandial so it's a lot of tests um, the uh the weight gain that's recommended by diabetes canada is um based on the weight uh, gestational weight gain uh targets as per the institute of medicine um and the uh um canada appendix does have um Recommendations for weight gain based on conception uh, BMI. Those can be easily looked up. The uh, NCUs in pregnancy, um, generally for type 1 and type 2 uh, patients, uh, we use uh, rapid acting insulin analogs. Um, strictly speaking, the DEP suggesting improved glycemic control. With an analogs compared to uh, regular or Toronto insulin, uh, in that great. Uh, there is some evidence of better postprandial control with the analogs. So, generally speaking, Diabetes Canada is recommending either Novo Rapid Humalog or uh, a PEDRA for type 1 diabetes uh, and type 2. For type 1 diabetes, we're using uh, uh, long acting insulin analogs preferentially. For type 2 diabetes and for gestational diabetes, I think NPH insulin. Uh, for a basal insulin is perfectly fine. Uh, it's less likely to develop hypoglycemia, especially in the second and third trimester. Both type 1 and type 2 patients, of course, will be prone to hypoglycemia at the end of the first trimester. Um, so that's the day period to watch. Uh, in pregnancy, um, now this is something that I haven't been doing in the past, but it looks like I'll be doing it now. Women with pre-existing diabetes, type 1, type 2, should start ASA 81 milligrams daily uh, at 12 to 16 weeks gestation to reduce the risk of preeclampsia. Uh, I think that's a new thing for me, anyway. Um, I'd be interested to hear if other people have been doing that route as well, or if this is a new thing. Seems um, there are some specific recommendations for. 
um, patients will be receiving um, betamizone for fetal maturation in the trimester uh, as to uh, uh, what to do to increase the basal and bolus insulin, avoid hyperglycemia, and potentially to avoid DKA in type 1s. Um, so there's, there's a, um, the guidelines do describe um, recommend increase in dosing on the, the first dose of betamethasone and, and uh, lasting for the next uh, four to five days. Um, and uh, this is interesting. This is based on a recent study. Um, they're suggesting that women with type 1 diabetes at least consider we offered um, real-time CGM uh, to improve glycemic control and reduce complications. This was based on a study called the CONCEPTS study. Um, and, in fact, uh, Dr. Denise uh, Feig, uh, who is the lead author of this uh, chat, was... Uh, I, I believe the lead author in that particular paper as well. It was in the Lancet was last year. And they found that in type 1 diabetes patients who were on CGM, uh, that although the, as compared to um, capillary blood glucose checks, that the C difference was, was minimal. It was only like a 0.2% uh, percent difference. Uh, but there was a reduction in uh, neonatal complications, uh, including neonatal hypoglycemia and uh Duration stay in the uh, in the NICU and, and the frequency of hyperbilirubinemia. Um, so it does seem to have an on outcomes in type one diabetes. Uh, I'm not an obstetrician, so I, I, I'm not making decisions with regards to fetal valence and timing of delivery. So that's generally uh, made by the maternity uh, folks. Um, so here are the recommendations with regard to non tests and. Uh, um, of labor really not changed at all, uh, and isn't changed either. Uh, so during uh, the active state of labor, both for type one, type two, and gestational diabetes for that matter, we're aiming for sugars between four and seven millimoles per liter to reduce the risk of neonatal hypoglycemia. And uh, we're on insulin pumps during labor um, if they feel comfortable continuing. Uh, the pump, then uh, certainly the evidence suggests that uh, should be encouraged to do so, um, as uh, the outcomes seem to be favorable when uh, when that's been looked at. So, um, unless there's extenuating circumstances, meaning that they may need to switch an insulin infusion, but generally um, patients may remain on pumps. And part of them, of course, we have to recognize that insulin requirements are reduced uh, immediately uh, as soon as the placenta is delivered. Uh, reduction in doses uh, as much as uh, 30 to 50 percent less than the total daily dose that was given preconception, at least for a few days to a week or so. Um, so, uh, um, you know, great reducing the insulin doses um, postpartum is necessary, uh, even less than the preconception dose, at least temporarily. Um, therefore, they need to check their blood sugars frequently. Uh, and then they make some recommendations about recommending uh, breastfeeding, of course, recognizing that uh, the uh, um, frequency of women, uh, continuing on with breastfeeding is less in type 2 diabetes than it is in the general population for a number of reasons. Um, but there are um, best to mom and baby with uh, the usual recommendations of uh, uh, breastfeeding for four months and uh, Continuing, if possible, to, to some degree for upwards of two years postpartum. What's unique about type 1 diabetes is, is the rate of uh, autoimmune thyroid disease in these women, and thus we should be, uh, if we have positive TPO antibodies identified either preconception or in the first trimester, that we should be looking for uh, development of postpartum thyroiditis uh, with TSH testing uh, 6 to 12 weeks postpartum. So before we go on to um, the gestational diabetes section, why don't we open it up a little bit now and if anybody has any questions. Great. Thank you. I'll just a reminder for folks to come off mute, just on six to open line, and we'll take questions or comments at this time. Okay. Dr. Phillips, I have a question for you. Um, with the use of NPH, um, 
in practice because that's what we've, we've always been using. If you have someone who's quite non-compliant to taking the second dose of of eight, so she's good in, in the morning, but she's not good at supper time, would you consider putting a person like that on Levimir or Lantus? Once a day coverage? This is uh, for uh, GDMs or for type type twos, right? Um, yeah, that would be a reasonable thing. I mean, I guess the problem is uh, we're quite insulin resistant, obviously, and, and uh, an NDH has certain advantages um, over the long-acting analogs due to the fact that they do have that that kick to them, you know, that sort of uh, that peak effect required in order to uh, um, you know, to deal with the insulin resistance. When you have uh, insulins with flatter profiles, you don't get that kick. Um, in, in some cases, it doesn't work as well. Um, but I think that would be a reasonable idea. Um, but, you know, generally speaking, for, for GDMs and type 2s, um, you know, I think NPH is, is the drug of choice otherwise. But uh, and that's special circumstances, that sounds reasonable. Okay, and if you were to do that, would you have a preference over Levimir versus Lantus? Um, well, if, if we're if we're sticking to the once a day thing, it would probably be Lantus because I mean it's certainly yeah. there's a large proportion of patients that do require Levimir twice a day. Once a day would be fine for the, for a Lantus situation. So I, I guess it would be Lantus. Okay, thank you. Uh, comments on the uh, change in the folic acid and the aspirin recommendation? Um, with the aspirin, it's only grade D evidence, so would uh, would you still be recommending? A lot of the uh, recommendations end up being grade D, don't they? <laughs> it's uh, um, I think I mean, the, the the idea behind it is to uh, preeclampsia. So I guess if if um, it may not be a blanket statement of a uh, a woman who's got no microvascular complications and an excellent blood pressure and uh, one diabetes for a relatively short period of time and 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 is relatively young, that would be. Um, Case you wouldn't do it, um, but for this is, um, you know, I, I, I guess you know, I, I think I'd be interested to hear what the what the maternity docs would have to say about that recommendation. Maybe we should bring that to their attention, saying in the guidelines it's grade D. Uh, what do they think about that? Because they're generally the ones that are making that recommendation with regard to uh, eclampsia risk and so on. Just to hear what they have to say. I've got a question here, Kamloops. Hello, well, it's Barbara and Kamloops. I actually have two questions. The first one is monitoring um, kidney function in pregnancy. I just wanted to speak to that, how often, what parameters. And the second was ketone monitoring with women with type 1 diabetes. Yeah, sure. Um, the, uh, I knew the ketone thing was going to come up. Um, so as far as the kidney function is concerned, if the albumin and the GFR is normal uh, preconception, um, I'm not in the habit of monitoring that throughout pregnancy. Um, it's only if the GFR is abnormal or if there's evidence for uh, micro or microalbuminuria uh, that I would be doing it uh, uh, at the same time frequently as, as the as the A1Cs. So the A1Cs would be done at least every three months, potentially every two months. Um, so that's my uh, approach to it. It's not specifically mentioned in the guidelines. As far as the, the tone thing, it's remarkable uh, that there's very little uh, of the role of tone testing in, in the guideline. I'm just going through the various... Uh, Here, and it's so lengthy I can't seem to find it. Um, but, um, there, I want to actually, uh, here we go. Uh, if you the guidelines, it's on uh, supple page 
269. And I'll, and I'll, uh, I'll and this is under the, the GDM section. In an effort to control their blood glucose by diet, women with GDM may develop starvation ketosis. Older studies raise the possibility that elevated keto acids may be detrimental to the fetus. While the clinical significance of these findings are questionable, it appears prudent to avoid ketosis. So for the DM crowd, you know, there's, there's no recommendations specifically for monitoring ketones. I think what uh, my practice has been is if there's a concern that, that a woman is uh, you know, gaining weight appropriately or if there's a fear that they're restricting their carbohydrates excessively, uh, that we would be checking ketones, looking for evidence of starvation ketosis to to reduce uh, hydrates in that setting. In type one diabetes, uh, I think uh, patients with diabetes in pregnancy uh, should uh, be able to test uh, either urine ketones or capillary ketones um, as sick day management or for unexplained high blood sugars and especially for those uh, who are on insulin pumps. So every uh, patient who's on an insulin pump, I've been recommending that they um, have a, a meter that allows them to do uh, calorie, uh, uh ketone testing uh, under those circumstances because, uh, of course, the pump patients, if they have a, a lack of insulin delivery due to a kinked catheter um, or an infusion that's plugged for whatever reason, um, they only go three four hours without insulin delivery before they'll start developing ketones. And in that situation, we know that, you know, till acidosis in type 1 diabetes in pregnancy has a, uh, you know, has a very poor prognosis as far as uh, the bit health is concerned uh, if it's allowed to continue. So uh, I'm a bit paranoid about ketones in type 1 diabetes, especially on pump patients. So the guidelines don't, they're, 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 they're a bit silent on the ketone question. Uh, and that's... Uh, a bit surprising, I must admit. Shall we come? Shall we blast through the GDM section? Hey. Okay. So um, they talk about trying to prevent uh, GDM in the first place, uh, and uh, the uh, um, importance of a healthy diet and weight loss, uh, which can be helpful in reducing GDM. And if one develops GDM in the first pregnancy, if one is able to reduce one's body weight through healthy diet prior to the next pregnancy, you can actually reduce the risk of uh, GDM in, this, in subsequent pregnancies. Um, uh, continuing to recommend universal screening for GDM in all women, not uh, doing selective screening, uh, screening at 24 to 28 weeks. Uh, again, much like the last guidelines, they have um, a preferred approach for screening versus an alternate approach. Their preferred approach is the two-step with a 50-gram challenge, followed by a 75-gram uh, glucose tolerance test thereafter if they fail the 50-gram. And the alternate test is the uh, standalone 75-gram uh, OGTT. Uh, where it gets difficult, of course, is that um, both the preferred approach and the alternate approach do have a 75-gram OGTT component to them, um, but there are different uh, glucose criteria for what is abnormal uh, of both those circumstances. So it makes things very, very confusing uh, for physician and even for the lab to, to be able to keep things straight. And, of course, the 25-gram glucose tolerance test results are clearly different uh, from the non-pregnant state. So it just, it, it's a bit confusing. In Aporia, we use the, uh, the one-step model um, just to try to avoid confusion um, recognizing that the two-step approach uh, has much more data um, and outcome data associated with it. Um, diagnosis. Um, this was interesting, and I'd be, I'd be interested to hear what people have to say about this, and I'm not entirely sure um, I know what to do with this. Let's just read this particular record. So women identified as being at high risk for type 2 diabetes should be offered earlier screening than 24 to 28 weeks with an A1C test at the first antenatal visit to identify diabetes. If, if there were any thought that they might have a spiritually high or low A1C due, a, due to a hemoglobinopathy or some other thing, then a fasting blood sugar should be done. And, they, and, and so in, 
in trimester, they say that you should follow non-pregnant criteria for diagnosing diabetes. So we want C over 6.5%, fasting blood sugar over 7. If they meet that criteria, you should be considered diabetes in pregnancy and treat such. If you're lower than those, they say, you know, and do your screening as per usual at 24 weeks. No, do, of course. I'm sure many people in the audience would do this as well. If I saw an A1C that was between 6 and 6.5%, if I saw a fasting plasma glucose that quite clearly was between 5.3 and 6.9, I would say, well, that's clearly abnormal. Um, and at the very least, um, I would be offering uh, the follow-up through the GDM clinic with home glucose testing to see if they're meeting their targets with dietary therapy uh, to whether they actually need to be on insulin. So they don't specify that, um, but there's a huge gap between, you know, having, you know, high risk for diabetes, first trimester, you know, do you have diabetes or not? Uh, is, you know, well, you may not have type 2 diabetes first diagnosed in pregnancy, but you may have sufficiently high blood sugars to justify treatment. Now, because there's no data to suggest that treatment of those, that latter group, is beneficial, they kept it out of the guidelines. But I, I must admit that I, I'd still be treating those people, following them closely. Uh, I'd to open it up for uh, on, that, on that point as well, Angela, if you don't mind. Yes, of course. And pound six, if you, anyone would like to comment on that point. Everybody's in agreement with me <laughs> that they would do the same thing. Um, but uh, some people need to be screened uh, before the, the, the usual time. And, and if the sugars are, are higher than the glycemic targets that we're looking for, in, you know, in the in the third trimester, I'm still, you know, following these folks closely. Okay, well, let's move on. So, so uh, weight gain, again, uh, per instant medicine guidelines. Uh, nutritional ca uh, counseling, um, I'll leave this to the experts who are the dietitians, but specifically suggesting um, uh, a low glycemic index diet uh, to replace high glycemic index foods um, and spreading the carbohydrates throughout the day uh, with a um, snack, including bedtime snack, uh, usual, nothing new. And if um, the diet punishment is unsuccessful at getting down to targets within two weeks, then generally looking at uh, basal bolus insulin therapy, targeting the insulin to where the sugar is high. Uh, for whatever reason, patients decline insulin. The drug of second choice in GDM uh, is uh, metformin. And if for whatever reason they don't tolerate metformin, drug of third choice would be glyburide. Surveillance is generally up to the uh, maternity people and or the wives with uh, non-stress tests and uh, rounds and induction of labor. Uh, the decisions aren't made by me. If I have any concerns, I certainly contact other team members um, let everybody know what's going on. Uh, and in are the same as type 1s and type 2s, breastfeeding recommendations, no different. Uh, one thing that is often not uh, accomplished by our patients is for them doing uh, a redo 75 gram glucose tolerance test within six weeks to six months of uh, delivery uh, to see that their um, diabetes resolved, whether they have impaired glucose tolerance uh, to help predict their risk of diabetes in the future. Um, um, Of course, the importance of uh, maintaining a healthy body weight prior to the next pregnancy to avoid GDM the next time. Um, and I think we can probably leave it at that. I think that's it. Recommendation four two. Yeah, we got through it on time. So uh, let's uh, open it again. Great. Um, for, or pound six to unmute your line. If you have any additional questions around the gestational diabetes management or earlier type one, type two management questions. 
Dr. Ellis, I do have a question um, in regards to the one hour versus two hour post testing. It seems there's a different opinions out there as to which one to use. And recently I came across a discussion where they said that there was stronger evidence for the t for the two hour post rather than the one hour post. I've always done whichever one's higher. I typically have women check one day, one hour, and then the next day two. And then we pick the one that's higher, which makes more sense than just relying on two hours because I think we could miss a number of people that way. What is your opinion? Yeah, um, I uh, yeah, it's not written in stone for sure. Uh, so women would type one actually. Um, oh, we talk about, I guess I guess it could be DMs as well. Are you talking about GDMs, type ones, type twos, or, or most of the GDMs because that's the bulk of who we see. Right. Uh, so in in uh, in GDMs, I've generally been recommending one hour, um, and if that is not possible for whatever reason. Uh, you know, I, I'm I'm having to fall back on the two-hour thing. Uh, I haven't been specifically looking at one versus two and, and picking the higher one. I mean, that makes sense. Um, I mean, generally speaking, under, under normal circumstances, the uh, the blood sugar is at its highest uh, in between them. So just just a little bit beyond the one-hour mark is is sort of a, a postprandial peak. Um, I uh, my, my practice has been one hour. I've been settling with two hours if it's necessary. I think your plan sounds sounds like a good one. Um, I mean, which, if there's a problem with with one or the other, then focus on that. Okay. Other questions from those on the line? Again, pound six to come off mute if you'd like. Comment that we had from a patient that was. Kind of told um, by, a, a, I guess, a health um, a healthcare professional that um, in DM, um, starting insulin would, I think, words were age the placenta more rapidly, and she and that was one of her concerns about starting insulin because that's what she had heard. Mm -hmm. Is that something you've heard or? No. No. Okay. Afraid not. Yeah. Um, the uh, uh, you know of uh, Insufficiency is interesting. The, <clears throat> uh, the, the guidelines do talk about uh, the uh, commonly seen reduction in insulin requirements in the third trimester um, in, in G type 2s and type 1s. Um, and uh, they say that the, the evidence that missing insulin requirements is really associated with uh, placental insufficiency um, is a bit weak, uh, and they downplay it a little bit. Uh, although I must confess that I don't downplay it, um, and I think they may have. There was a, an article that came out. I think it must have been within a year, uh, uh, within a year from now, uh, that may not have been included in, in the guidelines. But this particular study showed that there indeed was an association between 20% uh, drop in insulin requirements in diabetes of all types uh, and evidence for placental insufficiency. Now, placental insufficiency clinically is associated with, um, um, you know, reduced fetal growth uh, and uh, oligohydrinous and potentially unaltered uh, abnormal DOP flow in the in the umbilical cord and, and potentially even a ragged-looking um, on ultrasound. So, you know, placental insufficiency, the baby doesn't look as if it's getting full nutrition, so it's affecting its growth uh, and can be uh, anticipated by a drop in insulin requirements. So my, my uh, uh, sort of uh, practice has been, and this more recent study has uh, um, strengthened that practice, that if we see a drop in ins total daily dose insulin requirements of more than 20%, um, that I'm letting somebody know, the maternity doctor, to ensure that um, you know, they're at least once, if not twice a week, um, non stress tests being done and um, ultrasounds being done, looking specifically at the health of the placenta under circumstances. So most of the time it's going to be a false alarm, but sometimes it's not going to be a false alarm, and I just don't want to be in, in that situation where you miss something important. Thanks. Ashton, 
in the postpartum screen um, to, to test for prediabetes or diabetes, um, do you think, uh, I would be, uh, could they do like the fasting blood glucose or an A1C rather than have to do the sugar test? Because I feel, I wonder how many women aren't going to do that or, or don't end up doing that. And couldn't mm -hmm. they just moder monitor those parameters? Yeah, I mean, you'd think uh, it, 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 the, uh, the uptake of that would be a lot better. And certainly, you know, if they've had gestational diabetes, um, doing either a fasting glucose or an A1C once a year thereafter, I think, is, uh, is justified. Um, I think that what, what they talk about in the, in the body of the guidelines is that the uh, sensitivity of the 75-gram test is better than the fasting or the A1C, uh, and, that, and that's why they're, they're sticking to that particular thing. Um, of course, interesting to note that um, if you look, if you take 100 women and you do all tests on them, and um, glucose challenge versus A1C versus uh, fasting glucose, um, they're not going to be perfectly overlapping results for each person. So it's going to be like a Venn diagram. So each test will pick up a certain segment of of women, um, uh, whereas other ones won't. So as far as um, sensitivity is concerned, they're still recommending the, the glucose test. But, uh, you know, it's uh, the uptake is not that great. That's the reason. Thank you. Thank you. Well, there's no other questions or comments from the line. I'd just like to thank you all again for taking your lunch hour, and especially Dr. Phillips again for presenting. Um, just mention again, if you're looking for the guidelines, you can find them online at guidelines.diabetes.ca. As well, we are recording these sessions, and um, up upon completion of all the Lunch and Learns, we'll be posting them, and uh, an email notification will come up to you as attendees, so you can um, re-listen or share with colleagues if they weren't able to join us today. And we have another Lunch and Learn coming up next week with Dr. Phillips on special considerations for acute coronary syndrome, heart failure, and renal patients and diabetes management. So join us for that if you haven't already signed up. And thanks again pending. Thank you, Dr. Phillips. Thank you.